On the Auto Car Show this week, we test drive the new Volkswagen Passat, we take a ride on the Suzuki Intruder and we also bring you a test drive of the Jeep Compass petrol variant. The latest Volkswagen Passat was launched in Europe three whole years ago. It's been quite a long wait, but now it's finally here. Volkswagen took its time to bring this new 8th generation Passat to our shores, but then can you really blame them? You see, it sits in a segment that has been shrinking over the last few years thanks mainly to the growing popularity of SUVs, which is where most people would rather put their money. The thing is, even if you didn't want an SUV, there are already a lot of capable sedans to choose from. Direct rivals like the Skoda Superb and the Toyota Camry, and smaller cars with more premium badges like the Audi A3 and the Mercedes CLA. So yes, this big VW does have its work cut out for it. But they've launched it at a competitive price and they've loaded it with kit. So what we're here to find out on this drive from Jaipur to Udaipur is, was it worth the wait? Now while it does resemble the last generation Passat, what with its straight lines and business-like nature, it is actually a brand new car. This one is based on Volkswagen's MQB platform, just like the Skoda Superb and the Audi A3. Like the last car, it has a lot of chrome and it also has some really attractive full LED headlamps. But I have to say on the whole, the look is a little bit too plain and a little bit too understated. It's more of the same at the rear, where the strip of chrome and the small slim LED tail lamps don't do much to liven things up. It's a similar story here on the inside where everything is all very very business-like. Now I don't mind the all black upholstery but I can see how some people might prefer a lighter shade. And the design too is just so very Volkswagen what with its horizontal lines and simple shapes. But it is livened up a lot by a few details like this rather convincing strip of four wood that runs across the dashboard. Uh, loads of brushed aluminium all over the place, really well finished. And these vents that appear to be one continuous slab across the dashboard, punctuated by this clock in the center. Quality? Well, really, you cannot fault it for anything. Yes, this steering wheel is pretty much the same steering wheel you get in every Volkswagen ride up from the Polo, but you really can't complain because it's so well built and so nice to hold. The buttons are just just superbly finished as are the paddles as is the leather speaking of leather the seats are wrapped on this highline trim in napa leather and it's really soft and feels really comfy to sit in and while on the subject of seats the front seats are powered and they are heated which is a bit unusual i would have expected them to be cooled in a market like india the driver seat additionally also gets a massage function along with memory settings that's quite cool as with the last time, Volkswagen has done well to pack the Passat with equipment. Apart from the regular stuff you'd expect, you do get some cool features like hands-free parking, a 360-degree camera, hands-free opening and a powered tailgate for the huge 586-litre boot, driving modes with adaptive dampers, powered heated front seats with massage for the driver, nine airbags and neat displays that show how economically or aggressively you're driving. But though the touchscreen is very slick, we wish it was larger. Now at the moment you get only one engine in the Passat, it's VW's ubiquitous 2-litre TDI diesel and it's mated to a 6-speed DSG automatic gearbox. Now this is the same powertrain you get in the Skoda Superb and as such it makes the same output as well, 177 horsepower and 350 newton meters of torque. As we've seen from this engine before, it's quite a gutsy unit. 
power comes in right from about 1500 rpm and goes rather quickly all the way to the 5400 rpm red line it gives you a nice strong hit in the mid range and that's what you want from a nice diesel engine like this one slight disappointment is refinement it's okay when you're cruising at low rpms but the moment you put your foot down you do get this annoying drone and you can hear it inside the cabin you can also hear quite a bit of road and tire noise as well as wind noise but back to the powertrain and you will be happy with the performance on hand the gearbox for the most part works really obediently shifting as and when you want it to and really quickly and smoothly it's only at low speeds that it can sometimes get caught out by a sudden unpredictable move on your part in which case it might jerk just a little bit and interrupt the flow of power now you can of course take better control of the gearbox via the paddles behind the steering wheel but you can also alter the way the powertrain behaves using the driving modes by selecting either eco comfort normal sport or individual you can alter the passat's steering engine gearbox and suspension that's right this car comes with dynamic chassis control and that means you can adjust the dampers to suit your needs Now your initial reaction is that the driving modes don't make too much of a difference but as you start to push the car a little harder you start to see them take effect Particularly the steering which feels nicely weighted once you start going very really faster in sport mode and even the suspension which though introduces a bit more pitter patter over bumps does give you a lot more body control as a trade off Is it a fun handling car the Passat Well no not really I think the chassis and the steering would need to be a little bit more involving for that What it is though is a car that gives you a lot of confidence to push it really hard and really fast in a safe manner But of course a lot of people would choose an executive sedan like this for what's in the back seat so I think it's about time we go check that out As you can see space in the back seat of the Passat is absolutely excellent with only something like the Skoda Superb challenging it for space in this price range. Headroom is also really good and knee room well I've got ample room to stretch out. I'm about 5 foot 7 Sergio who is driving is about 5 foot 8 and both of us are very comfortable at this point. And as an added bonus you can even flip up the sun shades over here. And so just if you press the button just near the gear lever it activates the sun blind at the back as well. Now while I'm back here I should probably tell you about the Passat's ride. Here out on the highway it does feel quite stable but as you can see I am being moved around a little bit. And that's because I believe I've left the car in sport mode. Now so just if you don't mind turning it back to comfort mode and immediately it settled down that's the beauty of dynamic chassis control for you in comfort mode it still feels a little bit firm but in a good way just like a Volkswagen should and that inspires a lot of confidence when you're going fast and of course if a mountain road should appear on your radar switch it back to sport and you'll have a great time driving up which prompted me to take to the wheel again for the home stretch into udaipur So here's the thing about the new VW Passat. It ticks all the right boxes. Sure you'll have to forgive a slightly noisy engine and slightly noisy suspension, but if you can do that, there's nothing it really won't do for you. However, what is lacking can't be found on any checklist, and that's a little bit of character. You see people don't only buy cars with their heads, they buy them with their hearts too. And for this money you could potentially find a car with a little bit more pizzazz than this Passat. However, if being understated is your thing, I can assure you it's hard to find a more competent car than this. So 
Suzuki recently announced that they were moving away from the mass volume segment and focusing their energies on premium products. Now, just about a month later, we've got our hands on the first of these machines. And it's unlike anything you've ever seen at the price point. The new Intruder has a long and flowing design inspired by its much bigger brother, the Intruder M1800. The head turn on this design is the immense headlamp assembly and the long fuel tank, which looks substantial but actually holds one litre less than the Jigsaw. Above this lies an informative instrument display borrowed from the Jigsaw which sits within an angular cowl. The front of the fuel tank features enormous extensions that swoop down to encompass a big imitation air duct. The rear of the fuel tank tapers down towards a wide and accommodating rider's seat, which is split away from the pillion perch. And the tail, meanwhile, well, that's characterized by chunky plastic panels, a rounded grab handle, and a sleek LED tail lamp. So how does it all come together in person? Well, the Intruder is designed after some huge motorcycles, and it too is surprisingly big in the flesh. You could very well mistake it for a 400cc bike or bigger, and therein comes the undoing of this design. The front section, up to the rider seat, is actually quite striking and does a good job of hiding away most of the engine. But there's not much Suzuki could do about the relatively skinny tyres. Running the same 100 section front and 140 section rear from the Jixer, this is the maximum size Suzuki could use for this level of power without sacrificing on both performance and efficiency. The result is a typical upper body obsessed muscle man look. And while the front end is striking and aggressive, the rear is quite disproportionate. The funky dual pot exhaust does well to boost the intruder's presence from this angle, but it sticks out quite a bit to the side and that nice silver finish is going to be prone to getting scuffed in traffic or the parking lot. The intruder's styling is striking and polarizing in equal parts. It commands far more presence than most bikes out there on the street and love it or hate it, you're definitely going to notice it. Overall quality levels are decent, but a few plastics could use better finishing and it's worth considering what the effect of our roads will be on those numerous body panels in the long run. Borrowed from the Jigsaw, this sweet 155cc engine offers a familiar blend of smoothness and eager performance. If anything, the changes Suzuki have made result in a slightly stronger mid-range and that's ideal for a motorcycle like this. The air-cooled carbureted motor is largely the same and continues to produce 14.8 horsepower and 14 Nm of torque. But there are some changes in the form of a revised intake with a bigger airbox, a differently tuned exhaust and an additional tooth on the rear sprocket. Now all this is for the benefit of a stronger mid-range punch and the intruder delivers well here. However, the top end feels a bit weaker than the Jigsaw between 9 and 10,000 RPM and that's probably down to the additional 13 kilos the intruder carries over the Jigsaw naked. Nevertheless, city performance should be effortless thanks to the strong mid-range, but the bike does start to run out of breath upwards of 90 km per hour. And we suspect top speed should hover around the 115 mark. The engine otherwise offers all the Jigsaw traits we love with refined and eager responses and a smooth gearbox. The intruder's ergonomics should be comfortable for most riders. Tall people like myself will find the seating position accommodating, while shorter riders will appreciate the low seat height. The seats are well padded and even the pillion seat is quite comfortable. The intruder uses a modified version of the Jigsaw chassis, with changes made to accommodate a relaxed, feet-forward riding position and low seat. The bike sees a substantial 75mm increase in wheelbase thanks to a 20mm longer swing arm, a new swing arm pivot angle, as well as an offset rear shock thanks to the bigger airbox. At low speeds, the Intruder feels surprisingly light and agile for something that looks so big and this should make it friendly to ride in traffic. Braking performance is safe and confident and we're thrilled to see that single channel ABS is a standard offering. The 41mm front forks and preload adjustable rear shock are similar to the Jigsaw but have been specially tuned for this line of duty. As a result, ride comfort is good but the rear shock does have slightly less travel due to the new subframe and larger airbox. Couple this with a feet forward riding position and really bad speed breakers or potholes can give the back a bit of a jolt. But in most scenarios, the Intruder does a great job of proving to be comfortable but fun to ride.
The Suzuki Jixa is a cracker of a motorcycle and given the similarity to its frame, suspension, wheels, tyres and brakes, it's no surprise that the intruder is a good handler too. It changes direction fairly quickly, has a nicely stable feel and offers generous cornering clearance. You could easily take this bike out for a weekend ride to a winding road and it will entertain without feeling out of its depth. The Intruder is priced on par with the range-topping Jixa SFFI. At just under Rs 1 lakh, this bike is about 15,000 rupees more than the Bajaj Avenger 150. Suzuki is clearly going for a premium offering here and there's little to fault with the way the bike rides. As for how it looks, well that's a deeply personal decision and we're keen to see how the market responds. Jeep has a winner in the shape of the new Compass and what a shape it is. This car looks great, the interiors have an upmarket feel, it drives well and more importantly, its pricing is spot on. Now previously, we drove the diesel manual version of this car and were really impressed by it. This time, we have the petrol automatic variant. So let's see if this petrol is as impressive as the diesel. We've reviewed the Compass extensively, so in this video, we'll only focus on this petrol variant. The petrol is available only in two-wheel drive and the top two variants that is the Limited and Limited O get the Autobox. The base petrol comes with a 6-speed manual. For our test, we have the top spec. Curiously though, the alloys on this top spec petrol are identical to the diesel's mid-spec longitude variant. That aside, there's nothing else to tell the petrol apart from the diesel, from the outside at least. Even on the inside, the petrol compass is identical to the diesel counterpart, save for the gear lever and the tachometer. Also, being a two-wheel drive, it misses out on the four-wheel drive panel. So there's this additional storage area here, and the good thing is, its base is rubberized, so metallic items placed here won't rattle around. Powering this compass is a new 1.4 litre multi air turbo petrol that makes 163 horsepower and 250 Nm of torque. This multi air is 100 Nm down on torque compared to the 2 litre diesel, so performance isn't as effortless. You put your foot down and there is noticeable turbo lag below 2000 revs. However, once the revs start building, there's a nice, lusty wave of torque which lunges this car forward. Accelerate hard and that punchy mid-range induces some torque steer as the front wheels struggle to find traction. The engine itself is pretty free revving and will spin all the way till the 6500 mark. However, at higher revs, it isn't as refined as we'd have liked and tends to sound a bit too vocal and too boomy. However, all that torque does help the Compass Petrol achieve some pretty impressive in-gear acceleration times, but you really have to spin the motor beyond the 2200 RPM mark to access it. It also does the 0 to 100 km per hour sprint faster than the diesel, however, the latter feels more effortless to drive and a lot more fuel efficient too. This 7-speed dual-clutch transmission makes driving in the city a breeze with seamless and smooth shifts. However, when you put your foot down to make those quick overtaking maneuvers, there is a bit of delay and this dulls the entire driving experience to an extent. To counter the lag, there is a manual option, but that defeats the purpose of an auto. So it's best to use this transmission in a relaxed manner where it works more efficiently. There's neither a sport mode nor are there paddle shifters. The brakes too are not the best under hard inputs and tend to unsettle the rear of the car. The ride quality though is fantastic and the worse the road, the better the compass feels. Although it's a bit on the stiffer side in the city, it remains flat and planted out on the highway. 
Even its handling is very balanced for an SUV that sits so high above the ground. The steering is a bit lighter than the diesel, but it is still precise and inspires confidence while darting this SUV into corners. To sum it up, the twin-clutch 7-speed automatic gearbox could be a bit quicker to respond, and the sudden spikes in power take a bit of getting used to. The 1.4 turbo petrol doesn't have the same effortless performance as its diesel sibling, but by no means it's slow either. Basically, this variant will appeal to buyers looking for a smooth petrol SUV with the convenience of an automatic to battle congested city streets. The limited and limited O spec, priced at Rs 18.96 and 19.67 lakh respectively, are Rs 26 to 28,000 higher than a similar specified 2 litre diesel 4x2 manual, which will be a lot more efficient and with more power and torque to boot. So, unless petrol and automatic are on your must have list, the diesel compass is still the pick of the range and still the best SUV in its class. Yeah.